Welcome to Winchester Community Church. We're glad that you're here today. We're continuing our series, What is the Church? with the promise of peace. But first, one of our songs from today. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone Who took on flesh Fullness of God in helpless day This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones He came to save Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on Him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost. I am His, and He is mine, brought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme. Man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. What is the church? Last week we talked about me can be we because of he, meaning we. Ex- we individually, that's the me, accepting Christ changes who we are. It makes us God's children. Submitting to Jesus gives us inroads, and God the Father adopts us as his children and says, Be we, be my children together. God the Father is not a big fan of his kids fighting with each other, and yet you'd swear that that is the rule, not the exception, based on what we see too often in churches. And that's all possible for us to be we because of Jesus. That was the emphasis last week and the hope and promise that came with that. This is the picture that we had that went along with that. Too often we think of buildings. It's not the building. It's the people who may or may not ever be in the structure, right? The, the universal body of Christ goes well beyond the bounds of any building. And yet, 
we have little gatherings together that may often gather in a church-like looking building. Maybe they won't. Maybe it's a home. Maybe it's a trailer. Maybe it's out in the wilderness they meet. But the point is, are they there because of Christ and his work in their lives? Are they there showing the love of Christ and the truth of God to others? That's the church. And that leaves us to today. Well, this is kind of all leading into or the beginning of Acts chapter 2, which is our first picture of what that new thing, the church, is like. And Jesus, among other things, says, My peace I give to you. This one is from John 14. My peace I give to you. So the promise of peace is where we are today. That's the sermon title for today. We're going to be looking in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2. God is at work in the lives of his children, and that is a big part of what is part and parcel of the church. So, if you would please, turn with me to Acts, just after the Gospels, Acts chapter 1. I'm going to summarize chapter 1 for you. This is Luke, writing under the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit, and he's recounting what's happened. This is He's writing about the period just after Jesus' um, trials, crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection. And Jerusalem is still in an uproar. The period of time he's writing about Jerusalem is in an uproar. There is this man that has come who has been drawing crowds. He's been performing miracles. And he's been killed by the Jewish religious leaders through the powers of the Romans, and the masses were there to cheer. Now, many of those masses who cheered his death were also there to cheer his arrival just a little while earlier into the city of Jerusalem, hailing him as a Messiah, hailing him as an incoming king. There is anything but peace in Jerusalem. And yet the world is on the brink of knowing peace beyond anything ever known before because God is at work. His plan is being fulfilled. That promise of a Messiah coming that we see all the way back in Genesis 3 is now becoming real. And people from all over the world that we'll see in chapter 2 are hearing these things and they're wondering what's going on. And they are about to learn a lot more because God is about to work. He's going to have his people come and his people share. And the first one who leads, the one who denied Christ three times, is Peter. And Peter is going to pin the blame squarely on them. You killed him. That's what he's going to tell them. Among other things, he's going to share the gospel with them, but he's going to say, you killed him. And that's the truth for them, and that's the truth for us. They may have had more of an active hand cheering the leadership and the Romans on, but in fact, all of those, every human who has sinned, which is every human except Jesus, has a share of that blame. Jesus came as part of God the Father's plan to make a way for us to know him and to gain peace. But without that, there is no true peace. Now, Peter, speaking under the inspiration of God, is going to stick them in the chest and say, you heard of the Messiah, and that's true of us as well. So, before God brings peace, he brings turmoil, and we're seeing that turmoil. Before God brings peace, he brings turmoil. If your life is in turmoil, and you're not finding peace, it could be because God is trying to speak to you and say, there is something other than you that you need to be seeking. Because when we're comfortable, we like to imagine that we are God. Now, we wouldn't say that to ourselves, that sounds arrogant, but it really is, right? And if you've ever thought about the times that you're mad at God, why are you mad? Well, you could say it's because you lack humility. Humility is not having expectations, right? But in fact, we have a great deal of expectations. God, I wanted this and I didn't get it. It's often at the root of why we get mad at God. The funny thing is, God promises that he'll work to fulfill his will, to bring about his glory, but he won't necessarily do it in the way we want. That's where the real disconnect is for us. God brings peace only after he brings turmoil. So, let's talk about 
that. This is in Acts chapter 2. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 2. So just starting at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. This is the disciples. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time debating um, the active or non-active nature of tongues today. Here's what the critical point is. The point is, the Holy Spirit has come upon all of them. Now, if we look back in the Old Testament, what we see is God would very sparingly place His Holy Spirit in kings and in priests and in prophets. But it was not something, at least what we read in the Old Testament, that was common. Now, what we see is these followers of Christ, the Holy Spirit is upon them. And it makes sense, because what did Jesus say? He said, you are a royal priesthood. And kings, priests, remember what was going on in the Old Testament? Now, that's the church. That's those in the church who have submitted themselves to Christ. That's the very nature of what the church is. So the world was here, and God was here, and they're about to interact. Verse 5, it talks about who's in Jerusalem. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. So there has been this dramatic change in the apostles. And they've now come out in public. The world is here. These people have paid a lot of money, spent a lot of time, many of them, to get to Jerusalem, to do what they believe they need to do to honor God. So these are people who apparently are seeking God. And they're amazed, it says in verse 7, because they're hearing them speak in his own language. And they say, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? I mean, Galileans, if you wanted the American version of Galilean, think Appalachian Mountains. We all float from around here, all are you? Right? Galileans were considered stupid and lazy and kind of ignorant. They had a bad accent. I mean, people actually wrote about it. It was that bad, right? And so these guys are going, Whoa, that's not a Galilean. How does he know my language? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Eliamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontius, Pontus and Asia, so throughout Turkey and the islands and to the east, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to the Cyrene, so North Africa, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. So across North Africa, the Mediterranean Sea, all the way over to at least Italy and maybe further, people have come to Jerusalem. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. And isn't that the nature of what we tend to see in humans? Many, if they don't understand it, have to make fun of it. It makes them feel better. If I don't know what to do with it, I make fun of it, I diminish it, and therefore I feel better. It doesn't mean you've really dealt with it. It's just you've tried to make yourself feel better. But others were just amazed. What is going on here? And so what did they probably do? They probably listened all the more intently. And then in verse 14, Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. And he means just now, not always. Let this be known to you. Give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as some of you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. Meaning it's about 9 a.m. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And so now Peter quotes the prophet Joel. Verse 17, And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, unlike the Old Testament, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and my female servants in those days, I will pour out, pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So everyone who is in God in Christ, as we now know, but it's Joel didn't. All those who are God's spirit is going to be moving. 
This is unlike the model that they knew in the Old Testament, the kings and the prophets and the priests. Everyone was his, even servants, even slaves. That's pretty remarkable. Again, a freedom, a slave who is empowered like a king or a priest, isn't that, by definition, freedom as well? And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And what Joel is talking about there is end times. That's looking forward to end times. This is ushering in the end of times. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall, we, shall be saved. This is from the book of Joel. God has been making this promise that a prophet, a Messiah, is coming and will answer the needs that have come with the failure of the first Adam. As we begin to see in the New Testament, Jesus is called the second Adam, who does what is right, who pays the price, who makes a way. Peter is reminding us that God has been telling us this is going to happen, and now is. And Peter then moves on to the gospel while also doing that condemnation we talked about in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourself know. Remember Jesus several times would say, why am I doing this? To give testimony to my Father's plan. To give testimony to who I am and what God the Father wanted me to do. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, and you crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. You. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Jesus didn't die out of control. Remember what he said? I lay down my life, I pick up my life. He is something else. He is holy man holy God and the fact that he gave up his life. We couldn't tell the difference. We see dead. What we can't tell the difference is alive. And if you remember, we're not going to take the time to do it, but you can look and there are verses that talk about as he is being resurrected, others in other graves, the righteous in other graves are also resurrected. Can you imagine Aunt Sarah or somebody showing up at your door? Uh, uh, Sarah, you're dead. Well, I was, but God sent me. Ooh, that'd be an attention getter, wouldn't it? So, with all this going on, these guys are in turmoil. They're in turmoil. The listeners, because they think they're seeking God, but they're being confronted with all this craziness. They've heard all these stories about Jesus. Maybe they've even seen some of these people have risen from the grave at the same time Jesus did because of his impact, and yet here are the disciples being bold, speaking out in ways that they never had before. Remember, it wasn't too long prior, they were hiding in, in the upper room or other places, hoping the Romans or the Jews wouldn't come get them. And now they're out in public, talking to the masses in public. And it reminds us of this, peace at the feet of Jesus, no matter what's happening around you. We were talking in Sunday school today about Saul. Saul was the best equipped Israelite. He was anointed by God to be king. He had spent time with the prophets, and yet when Goliath came, when the world challenged him, he hid in his tent. The king of Israel, established by God, hid in his tent, because what he was seeking was him. The apostles, the disciples, up until now, had been hiding, because they were worried about them. What about me? What about me? If they're gonna kill the teacher, they're gonna kill me. I'm gonna hide. Now the Holy Spirit's come and strengthened them. And they've gone out and said, here is the truth. And in fact, not doing anything of their own power, the masses are hearing the words in their own language. And so here we are. Peace is being communicated by those who are in Christ, who are at the feet of the cross with Jesus. And what is peace? This is really important because we, it's like love, right? Love is a word that just means almost nothing the way we tend to use it in English. I love my dog, I love chocolate, I love my wife. Hmm. Okay? Yeah, but we actually mean more than that, don't we, right? We have levels, maybe we should do a scale of one to 10 when we talk about love. 
On a scale of one to ten, I think you're a nine today, as far as how much I love you, right? Uh, remember, it's Mother's Day, tell your mom's ten. Okay, so. But uh, we also need to define peace. Peace as the world defines it is, I get everything I want when I want it, right? Does that work? No. One of the surest ways to derail somebody is give them everything they want. Have you ever noticed, and maybe you've been this, or maybe you've seen it in your life, um, I know growing up, some of the most dissatisfied people I knew were the richest people I knew. Their parents gave them everything. Here's a new car, you're 16. Here's this, hey, we'll send you skiing. Here we go, you can go do that again. I'm bored, there's nothing to do. This is so, uh, uh, uh. I can tell you from a military standpoint, most of your terrorist organizations are led by rich, spoiled kids because they're looking for a thrill in life, right? God says, no. That's not peace. That's what the world tells you is peace, and so we can be assured that it's a lie, right? It's trying to derail you. God says, if we're to pull together what we read in Scripture, this isn't a single Scripture, peace comes when we know things are working as they should be, and how are they working? according to God's will. That's where transforming us, as we read about in um, Corinthians, that transforming power of the Holy Spirit in us, that we are a new creation and we begin to see things differently. We begin to see things like God has them planned for His glory. If this happens, does that bring glory to God? If this is said, is it the truth? Is it the truth in love? We have a purpose and a relevant. That brings peace in God's kingdom. We're headed in the right direction towards God and His glory. That brings peace in God's kingdom. We're free from fear because God is in control. That brings peace, or that is peace. We know that God is in control. That's really the fundamental component of peace. But if we're always trying to be in control, we can never truly be at peace. So peace is impossible if we're in charge in our lives. And think about it. How many times have you been there, right? Oh, I don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Wasn't well, that true of all of us? I mean, how many of you know what will happen five minutes from now? Right? If you did, you'd probably have your own show, right? Selling that talent. But we don't. And the further out it gets, the more honest we can be that we don't know. God even reminds us, hey, remember, in me, James 4, if you're going to go make a profit, do business, remember, as the Lord wills. That's really important. And God cautions us there to keep it in mind that it's Him. It's impossible to have peace when we rely on ourselves or anyone else or anything else, right? How often have you seen or done it yourself? I get this new thing. It's going to bring me joy and peace. No, it's not. New house. Great security system. Whatever it is. A new car. It doesn't bring joy and it doesn't bring peace. If we're counting on anything else to take the place of God, we will not be at peace and we will not have joy. They tend to go hand in hand. However, submitting to Jesus brings us together with him, and when we're together in a body of those submitted to him, there is a reassurance of his presence, there's a reassurance of the peace that comes in knowing he's in control, and there's a re-emphasis of the joy that we can have. Let's go to verse 25. For David says concerning him, speaking of Jesus, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. I may not be shaken, is another way of saying, I am at peace. I am at peace because God is there. Here's God. We have a lot of this military language in the Old Testament, right? The Lord is my right hand, my butler, my shield, my sword, my defender, my tower. That's what he's talking about. I have peace because I know he's in control. He's protecting. And therefore, in verse 26, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Remember how peace and joy go together? Just another example, thankfulness for God's work that brings peace and promise. My flesh will also dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You may, you have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. This is Jesus, excuse me, this is David speaking prophetically of Jesus all the way back in Psalms. Now, in Acts 22, excuse me, Acts 2, verse 29. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us today, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one 
of his descendants on his throne. David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption, uh, because God has promised a resurrection. 32, this Jesus God raised up, and, that, and of that we are all witnesses. Remember, this is, the city is abuzz because people saw things. Even folks in the audience, likely many of them saw some or all the events related to the public activities leading up to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. He's telling them, look, the Holy Spirit is here at work to share the truth with you. For God did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. God says, be at peace. I am going to bring the world into submission. And of course, remember Jesus said, hey, don't be surprised. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. That's the enemies that we're talking about, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Verse 36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Oh, by the way, did you forget? It was your responsibility, and he tells them, but God made a way through Jesus Christ. And in verse 37, Here's the response. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. Thousands hearing this feel God at work. That conviction, that conscience that is being touched right now by the Holy Spirit. They've just been told they're not only sinners, but they're enemies with God. Wait a minute, I gave up my job my business to come here and worship God. It's the only time in my life I've been able to come, perhaps for many of them, because it was so expensive and so hard. And you're telling me I'm an enemy of God? What? And this is the prophet, the Messiah that was to come, that was promised by God? What? And I was involved in that? They're in turmoil. And they don't know what to do. Some are going to say, help me. What is it we need to do? They'll accept the blame. They'll seek a remedy in God. And others will go, no, this is ridiculous. Can't be, no, 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 I can't hear you. This can't be true because it conflicts too much with my reality. The Holy Spirit is at work, though. Open opposition to God ensures chaos. If we've got a load of it in the world. Confusion, lack of peace. You've seen it, right? Hidden opposition to God, it's there too. People dress themselves up, and isn't that the fakery that most church folks are accused of? Hypocrisy. Oh, I'm uh, quite good. Uh, I've never had any problems. Uh, I don't sin. I don't smoke. I don't chew. I don't go with girls who do. Right? Isn't that the image of the church? The image of the church is no, 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 don't, 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 no, 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 don't, 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 don't. Right? Jesus says, live. Live out the truth in me. That's the opportunity for peace. Submission to Christ and reliance on God the Father provide our best interests, provide peace because God is at work. And then Peter gives them this solution in a nutshell. This is the end of the chapter. We're nearing the end of the chapter. And he said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? That's the people looking for a solution. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Turn to God, repent of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. This could be 3,000 men and women and children added beyond the 3,000. It doesn't really matter. Here's a short sermon, conviction by the Holy Spirit, and changed lives. 3,000 people seeking peace and finding it. This submission led them to live out their new life in Christ as the church. We know some of them didn't even go home. It was such an impactful thing. And then we come to Acts 2.42, which kind of paved the way for the rest of this series. In Acts 2.42, we read, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. 
people whose lives have been in turmoil now gather together in peace in the body of Christ. There's still turmoil around them, but with Christ at the center, there is peace. These me's have become we through he, and in that they find peace. They found life. You know, revival, as I mentioned before, requires humility and submission. They've done that by turning to God. They've repented. They've done that. And now God is restoring them, transforming them. And in this, they grow in commitment to him. They grow in a desire to hear his word and to be in fellowship and to worship him and to reverence whatever God has for them. And that's what you see them doing here. What are the four things that we're talking about? They dedicate themselves to learning the apostles' teaching and God's word. They dedicate themselves to fellowship, learning, encouraging, we might say discipleship with one another, because the next one is the breaking of bread, which we can also call unity and community. Why do we do communion? It reminds us of what Jesus did for us, but we're told to do it together, not go off in a quiet place and do it by yourself. It's the body of Christ being reminded that unity, peace, truth, salvation, all come together in Jesus Christ. And then finally, prayer. Praying is a big part of what they do, those big four. And God worked in miraculous ways in their hearts and lives. And as you read the rest of that chapter, you see that they're looking out for each other and that God is working and that God is showing them favor and many come to know the Lord. And as we read in the last verse, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so a lot is going on here. You know, here's a question for you. Are you stressed? The American Psychological Association two years ago came out with a report that said the United States is facing a national health crisis that could yield serious health and social consequences for years to come. And they asked people, what are you worried about? Listen to some of the things that people were most worried about that caused them significant stress. They felt out of control. They couldn't do anything to control this. They were not at peace. Healthcare. 66% said they were significantly impacted by worries of health care. 62% mass shootings. 55% climate change. 51% the suicide rates. 47% out of control immigration. 47% sexual harassment and assaults. 45% the opioid epidemic. Realizing, of course, that for most of those, there's nothing they can do about it, and most of them are not directly affected, and yet that's what they're most worried about. Why? The voices they're listening to are the world's voices telling them you have to worry about this. It wasn't until they got to some later questions they found out, oh, you're also worried about your job, your finances, your home. About two thirds of the people said, yeah, well, yeah, now that you ask, that bothers us too. But they've taken so much of the world on above anything else that they couldn't be at peace because they're worried about all this stuff out there that isn't even within their control and doesn't even impact them. How often have you been out of peace because of that? When you lay down at night and that nagging thing in your head, whatever it is, the world of flesh, the enemy, bring up, right? Or maybe it's God saying, hey, you need to do this, but it brings it up. Usually if it's something you can't resolve, usually if it's something that just kind of keeps eating at you, and it's not something you can turn over to God and say, Father, I'm trusting you for this, or forgive me for this. That's what tells us we're seeking our hope, our peace in the world. And we can't control the world. God can control the world. You know, 65% of Americans in this 2020 survey said the uncertainty of the nation's future and the number of issues the United States was facing overwhelmed them. They struggled to make it through the day. That's even before you ask them about home and work and finances. In fact, the United States of America, the most church, Christian country in the world, Christian in quotes, because that's what people say they are, it doesn't mean they live it out, is also the most stressed country in all the world. Who's trying to be in control? God says, I am in control. He's actually got proof of it. But we're too often going, I'm in control. And I want God to do what I want to do. And so, 
All of us are there sometimes. Some of us are there all the time. And we feel out of control and stressed and guilty and stressed and mad and stressed, right? May God challenge you to know his presence, to see him as the answer. Turn to him to deal with those things and go, God, help. Even if you're not as stressed as the average American, is there room for you to grow in the certainty of God's control, God's love for you, peace that he brings? I guess so. I think that's probably true as long as we live. So constantly going back to God and saying, hey, Lord, I think it's me again. I'm sorry. Help. Let's take some time to lay this to prayer. We'll pray a couple minutes and I'll close. Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you that you love us and that you want to work in our lives and that we can have peace, Father, even in the midst of turmoil with the world, the flesh, the devil, and all the minions stomping about, yelling, screaming, accusing. Father, you love us and you're there still. Help us to seek your will, your truth, your glory. And Father, we pray along with some of our Puritan brethren from several hundred years ago, your power is infinite and your wisdom is infallible. Direct our lives, Father, that whatever comes won't hinder or discourage us from living a life pleasing to you. Please stand between us and trouble that no evil befall or sin corrupt what you've given us. The gifts, the hope, the passion that you put in us. Keep us from being discouraged or being derailed from your cause, Lord. That includes our own foolish ideas that might take us from the role you call us to. Don't let us waste time working on things you don't love and won't bless. We want to be covered by your shield and your strength so we don't fear, so we have that peace, so we're not worried about physical attacks or health problems, evil talk and evil action by others, the hurt and distraction that others bring, the foolishness of youth, the temptations of middle age and the regrets of old age and the fear of death. Never let us forget that we are entirely dependent on you for what is important in life. You're the only one who can truly support and counsel and comfort us, uphold us by your Holy Spirit, Father, so that we're not just satisfied with knowing Jesus as Savior, but that we're always moving forward, always growing, always gaining in your kingdom, and in whatever you give us to do, strengthen us by your Holy Spirit for every purpose of our Christian lives. We give you all that we value so that you might work mightily in our lives. Our names and our reputations, which should now be focused on Christ, our bodies, our souls, our talents, our characters, our successes, our failures, our spouses, our children, friends, and work, our present, our future, and our end. It's a big ask, not for you, but it is for us, Father, because we're saying we trust you even though we know it's quite likely you won't do exactly what we want. But Father, may you take all of this. And may what we have and what you've given us and what we are be yours for those who follow Jesus now and forever, that we know true peace in and through him because you love us and that you care for us and you poured your grace out upon us. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. gift of grace 
is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I. But through Christ in me The night is dark But I am not forsaken For by my side The Savior He will stay I labor on In weakness and rejoicing For in my need power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hold my hope is only
that I may have added or we may have added in our minds, and may your truth and your love be made clear throughout. May we know peace in you. We thank you, Father. Bless and keep each one here. And give them traveling words, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have prayer requests, questions, comments, giving, whatever it may be, you can contact us here. In the meantime, we're praying for you. Will you pray for us? God bless you.